On this episode of the Dudes and Dads podcast, we talk with Cliff Boyer. You're listening to the Dudes and Dads podcast, a show dedicated to helping men be better dudes and dads by building community through meaningful conversation and storytelling. And now, here are your hosts, Joel DeMott and Andy Lehman. Hi, Andy. Joel. Andy. I feel like we just recorded a podcast. It's probably because we did, but we're going strong. We keep on recording more, and uh, I'm just happy to say it really feels like this is a season where we might be getting our act together. Don't say that, because every time we say that, then something happens, yeah. so let's yeah. not do no, that. So, no, you know what? Forget I said it. We'll never have our act together. Just feel fortunate that you're even hearing our voice right now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Andy, as always, so good to be back on with you. Absolutely. And, uh, we're, we're just super excited about uh, our episode here. We, I feel like, Andy, when things are going, are going really well, and we're maybe, I, again, I don't want to speak too highly, but uh, when we feel like we're at the top of our game, a big part of that is, is just the quality of the stories that we are getting from our guests, the, the things that have to be shared. And... Uh, yeah, our episode this time is no exception to that. We just are really, really grateful um, to have our good friend Cliff joining us this evening and uh, or morning or whenever you're whenever listening. You're listening. Generic time of the day. Good yeah. morning. Good, in, good generic in, time of the day. Good evening, afternoon, whatever it is you're listening. We're so glad that you're uh, with us to hear uh, Cliff Boyer share. Uh, just a, a, an amazing life story, um, things that are, I, but I think will probably hit home with a lot of folks in one way or the other, the chances of you connecting with his story, either you're a, a family, friend, relative, or something that touches on something like this, I think is going to be uh, relevant. So Cliff, welcome to the Dudes and Dads podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. It's good to have you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cliff is, uh, w- many of the folks that come on our shows, they've they've never been recorded before, and they are experience the same experience we all hear when we hear our voice through uh, a microphone. It's it's a little, it's a little daunting. Uh, it's the daunting. First time. It's a little. It's a but but Cliff uh, in his bravery has decided to to subject himself <laughs> to this the recording studio. So. We're so we're so grateful, Cliff. Uh, let's just we'd like to start with uh, the dad stats uh, sometimes, which that's uh, basically you tell us about uh, your wife, your kiddos, uh, any grandkids that you've got. Tell us who they are and uh, and and all that good information. Now you got to keep we're on, you're on the spot now because you, <laughs> you can't miss any names, right? I know. I know. Uh, we could be here all <laughs> afternoon. Oh, my wife's name is Rose. Um, we've been married for um, 31 years. My children are Amanda Gall, who's the children's pastor here. Uh, my daughter, Allison, who lives in Webster. Um, and of course, my son, Andrew, who is, who's gone. We, we lost him in 2019. Um, my oldest son, Tom, who is my wife's son. I have three stepchildren. And... Uh, our oldest daughter, Teresa, who, well, Tom lives in Syracuse, Teresa lives over in Elkhart, and uh, our daughter, Amy, lives in Florida, and yes. she just, this last March, just recently became an RN. Okay. I'm not going to attempt to name all the kids, <laughs> yes. because yes. we have 14 grandchildren. There we go. Wow. That's a good number. Yeah. And we have yeah. 20 great-grandchildren. Oh, my wow. goodness. I, I gotta say... The man does not look like a great grandfather. <laughs> no, to, to his credit, does not look like a great grandfather. And I don't blame him for not wanting to name all. <laughs> no, of them. no, I, I sometimes it, can't get my own kids. I'd get it right. It'd be like yeah. you, hey, you with the face, yeah. kiddo. What num- number three? Where are you? Whoever you are, yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, and and Cliff, I, I, fa- and the, as we will just want you to share your story. I mean, family comes in obviously as a big part of just your your journey uh, as a as a person. But one of the reasons that we really wanted to have you on the show, uh, we just we just feel because we we know it's it's true of our of our listening community um that the story of of battling with addiction and and a life of addiction and and trying to find um hope and healing in the midst of addiction is just like it's a story that needs to be heard and it's a conversation that needs to be had so wherever you want to start in your story um (laughs) and and how you are here today as the as the Dare, dare I say, dashingly handsome and just generally pleasant <laughs> guy that we have in front of us here. Uh, <sighs> would just love to hear the journey um, that you have that you have been on, and kind of wherever you want to start, feel free to start. I'm going to start uh, when I was a kid. Um, 
I was raised uh, by my father and my mother, obviously, Clifford Boyer Jr., because I'm the third, and my mother, Dolores. Um, we lost my dad when he was 59 years old to a, a tree cutting accident. And, uh, but up to that point, um, they were good parents. We were raised in the church. Um, but I, I never caught on to the concept of God. Um, I was baptized when I was 14 at 8th Street Mennonite. Um, I was subjected to a lot of things. Hard work was one because we were dairy farmers and grain farmers. So I learned to work. Yeah, you dug yeah, it. Right. You, know, you yeah. didn't get out of it. Nope. <laughs> there was no playing video games. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but you know, we, we uh, dad always had a boat. I learned to water ski at a young age. Um, both my father, two of my uncles, and my grandmother and my grandfather, my grandpa, grandma Boyer, were all pilots. Wow. So I was around aviation from a young age. And uh, we also used to mow Goshen Airport. So, I've been influenced in a lot of areas, um, but the, one of the things, a couple of things I'm most grateful for is I'm grateful for the work ethic that my parents and my grandparents gave me. Um, but I'm also glad for the foundation uh, with God. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I hesitate to say the church because I've never been, I've just never been big on church. Mm -hmm. Join the club. Uh, it's, <laughs> organized religion is just not a big, it's not, I don't know. I'm going to leave that at that. Um, the, you know, that being said, I started running with the wrong people. And I'd say I started running wrong with the people probably in junior high, but more so in high school. Um, I started running with the, with the guys that partied hard. Um, like smoke pot, uh, and we experimented with various chemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up during the v Vietnam era. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, graduated from Goshen in 71. And for anybody listening that's close to my age, I, uh, Bill Doba was my football coach. Mm -hmm. um, after high school, there were, uh, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say this, there were only basically uh, three things that I cared about, and that was money, uh, women, and drinking. Um, and that was pretty much my lifestyle. Now, there were a lot of in-betweens there. I actually, uh, drinking was a problem at a younger, at my young, in my younger years. Uh, my sister had taken me to a meeting in 74, and I didn't get serious about getting sober until 2011. Mm -hmm. There were periods during that time where I was arrested. Um, I did what I had to do to stay out of trouble. Um, I went to meetings or I went to see a shrink or a counselor. Uh, I said all the right things, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling the right things, yeah. and I definitely didn't know who God was, yeah. even though I thought I did. Um, that's just sort of a, a nutshell where yeah. this all started and led to. Yeah. When I, by 2011, uh, my lovely bride had had enough. Um, she told me that she would do anything to help me, but she would not stand by and watch me kill myself. And at that point, I had a decision to make. Um, so I went over to Elkhart to a, to a building there, and I'm keeping a lot of this anonymous and not mentioning names because of the organization I sure. belong to. Yep. Sure, right. Yep. And uh, I went to my first meeting, and, and it, it turned out to be for narcotics. Boy, was I surprised. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. But they were gracious enough to let me set. Yep. And it followed then by um, that following Tuesday, I started going once a week. Um, I had no concept of how to get sober, how to stay sober. They started talking about God, started talking about spirituality. And, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm not even going to say what I said in my head, but I'm like, what the, 
devil are you people talking about? Yeah. Um, but God knew he, I, I mean, he knew I was desperate. He knows everything about us. Uh, I've learned that since then. I did not know that at the time. I honestly didn't. And I started to uh, just go to the one meeting a week. There were two gentlemen there. One of them who was my first sponsor, um, they saw through the facade. Because when I went back, I was a, a pretty rough character. I was shaving my head back then. I had a full beard. I hated everything in this world, including myself. I didn't like people. I didn't like being around people. Um, and I didn't make it a secret. Mm -hmm. uh, for over a year in the meetings, nobody knew my name. I just came in, sat, and left. Um, the two gentlemen that I just mentioned prior, they finally uh, kind of snagged me a couple times and said, hey, um, what are you really here for? I thought it was pretty obvious, but so they said, uh, I told them, I said, I just, I can't quit drinking. Um, I'm really suffering hard. I'm not drinking right now, but, you know, I can't sleep at night. I'm sweating. I probably should have went to treatment, and I didn't, but I was just really bullheaded like I still am. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I suffered through it. Um, it, was, it was physical torture is what it was, and mental torture. And, and spiritually, I was just completely bankrupt and had no clue what was going on around me. But... One night after meeting, and, I, and I'm guessing this was around the 14 month, 13 month that I had been sober, I went home and I went down in the basement and I completely broke down. Um, I, I begged God to take the compulsion that I could not control away from me. I, I was desperate because I, I was, um, for all the macho crap that I was displaying on the outside, I was afraid mm. and I didn't want to die. Yeah. And after that day, I did not have a compulsion to drink. Uh, there were times I would say that I have had a desire to drink. I thought about it, you know, be really hot and outside and I'd be working. I'm saying, man, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A yeah. double shot of Johnny Walker Black right now sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, but I never came close to, to uh, giving in to that. Um, when you're addicted like that, when, when you're dealing with addictions and you're in the middle of addiction, um, I've come to understand that I will be in recovery the rest of my life. There is no cure for alcoholism. There is no cure for drug addiction. Abstinence mm -hmm. is the only positive outcome of this whole thing for me. Yeah. Um, well, it's not the only thing, but it's, it's the best thing that's coming out for me. Um, it takes quite a while to regain your rational thought, rational thinking, um, organized thought. Because uh, if I had to explain my thoughts for the first two years, um, I'm pretty sure that they would commit me to an asylum. Mm -hmm. It was just, I was just all over the place and I was pretty nuts. Um, I was very explosive during that period of time as well. And I guess that's the thing is, you know, and we, and we talked about some of these things in the sermons over the last few weeks is, is perseverance. And uh, I, I call it staying the course. But you have to go to meetings. You have to get right with God. And since I am in a 12-step program, I have to work the 12 steps with a sponsor. Mm -hmm. And that sponsor needs to be an individual that you can literally trust with your life and anything you tell that person, that yeah. that person will hold that confidence. Yeah. Because in order to get sober, everything in my life had to come out from little up. Yeah. You know, and I've talked about that in, in uh, several times here that I've talked here at church that at a very young age, I was uh, age, I was stealing and lying. 
Um, and it was second nature. Mm. And I guess that's what a little scary for me. Yeah. Um, I think there were some things that me that were inherently wrong with me from the very beginning. I had what we consider to be an alcoholic personality. Okay. So, well, so when you say alcoholic personality, like what would you, what are some key things that you would help identify that go along with that personality that you would identify? Very up and down emotionally, uh, like a roller coaster. You're either high or you're low. Very few in betweens. Um, excessive. Okay. You have excessive behavior mm-hmm. um, and, and excessive eating, excessive, you know, and I've done all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, I was raised a farm boy. Yeah. Just a little old redneck boy out in Goshen, Indiana. <laughs> okay. We were farm people and we ate. Um, every morning we had done milk and we went in. My grandma Boyer had a full spread out there. We had ham, eggs. Yeah. Potatoes. Right. So I grew up eating like a horse. Uh, I thought this was normal. Mm-hmm. Finding out now it's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My daughter in Florida keeps telling me portions, dad. <laughs> portions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I won't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would say those are... Just some general things. Yeah, I mean, it just seems give, so. Given to excess e- easily, yes. also um, a feeling of like, as I've heard some people explain it to this, like just being very, very intense about th- like very intense, like yeah. getting because people will talk like about addictive personality types, and it sometimes it is identified in what seems to be harmless, harmless things, but you're you're just you're, you become fixated on things or very like very deep into them in, in some in some way or another way overboard yeah and um oh what was i gonna say um trying to think what i was gonna say there Oh, it's gone. It's okay. That's right. Yeah, it's okay. It's fun getting old. No, <laughs> but so, but as you said, like way, way over, way overboard. Mm-hmm. There's just these kind of intense highs and intense lows, um, and those things to identify. And and again, you, you know, I wonder because uh, I think it's like we can dismiss, uh, depending on the the life stage that a person is in, we can dismiss that as being if we see those personality traits as being like, well, they're just, they're young or they're immature or whatever. And that's, and that's, and that's what they do. Do do you feel like, you know, without, without rattling the bones of those, of those that have gone by, like, do you, do you feel that, because you just said that these things seem normal within your family, like kind of some of these, these things. So you, do you have a sense that there was there were things about you that were overlooked or was you know that the things that were just missed that if you have had been caught earlier it would have been different or I know it's always hard to sometimes look back I can't really criticize my mom and dad or my grandparents it knows who I would consider mm-hmm. to be my <laughs> mentors growing up um, they did the best they could at the time and the best of their ability yeah and and that's the way I view that mm-hmm. and I don't hold anything there I I love him dearly. Yeah. I wish that I would have had the opportunity to make amends more to my father than I did. Sure. My father really never saw me sober, sober. Mm. Um, I had bouts of it, but um, that's disheartening. And and my son, Andrew, that yeah. we lost. Um, I consider myself, as far as being a father, I know I did a lot of things with my kids and I did some things, but I wasn't a good father. Uh, I did not consistently take them to church. I did not consistently teach them about the Lord, our our Lord and Savior, Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Um, I didn't read enough scripture to them. And uh, and I regret that. And, And on the one thing that I carry close to my heart and my sponsor says, no, don't go there. But on the day that it happened with with Andrew, um, I had an opportunity to go hunting with him, and I worked instead of going hunting with him. 
and I carry that every day. Sure, yeah, sure. I carry that every day. That's yeah. that's something. And, and and when my wife sees this, she's just going to rip me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because she said you can't do this. But yeah. that's something that's it mm-hmm. doesn't stay with me all the time. Right. It it, it right. does. It's like not forgetting the past. Sure. So uh, and uh, I often wonder um, when when I know the people that are in recovery, uh, you know, there's these triggering events. If, if there is some sort of uh, significant loss, uh, a, a time of grief or whatever, would you say there was a concern with your family? Like when in that, in that season of, you know, is, is Cliff going to stay sober? No. Okay. So, so how, 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 how do you get to that, that place? Okay. Um, I've stayed sober long enough and I feel that um, I'm strong enough in my faith with Jesus Christ and because he saved my life. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I say this in any lead that I give is, uh, mm, I almost said it, the organization I attend, yeah. <laughs> they got me sober, yeah. but Jesus Christ saved my life. Yeah. Now, I know a lot of people are going to think that's a contradiction, but it's really not. And if you are alcoholic or you are an addict, you would understand that last statement sure. wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Um, no, not once during that period did I think about drinking. I can say that in all yeah. honesty. I not once did I. That's good. That's I never, great. Yeah. I never even thought about it. So, and I think it can be, a, and to think about this, like that can be a great, I think a great encouragement to people to know that there is an opportunity that even when life throws you just some of the hardest things that you can possibly imagine that still in the midst of that, there can still be, there can still be health. There can still be a, a sense of like, yeah, I don't have to, I don't have to go back. I don't have to go backwards. Um, and, and which just can seem, especially if someone is in the midst of, in the midst of their addiction right now, I mean, it can seem pretty, yeah, just a, a like pretty amazing. I would think it, it, when things were at their worst for you, um, did like how did you view your life? Like what what was your what was your sense of the value, your personal value, your the sense of any sense of hope? Uh, how were you thinking about those things? It sucked. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, low self esteem. I had extremely low self-esteem. I didn't like myself. I wasn't happy with who I was. I wasn't comfortable with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I believe that I had always uh, sought approval, uh, specifically from my father and my grandfathers, my, the male figures in my life. Um, I don't think I ever measured up to their expectations. Um, I dearly hope that I'm wrong. <laughs> and and when I see them again, because they're all gone now, yeah. I, I hope they just laugh at me and pat me on the head and say, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. you fat dummy. <laughs> yeah. We love you. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yep. But um, yeah, I think low self-esteem, there are a lot of character defects that we carry. Uh, my temperament was absolutely horrible. I mean, I... I had a hair trigger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd snap on you and be ready to fight like right now. Yeah. It was just, I was a dynamite keg. Um, and so you, you would say the program that you're in has helped, helped kind of bring that down in your life. Yes. Okay. Dramatically. Mm-hmm. But I still have the ability. Sure. Just because you start getting better and you, and, uh, and, and we talk, and I talk to the guys a lot about God. Because spirituality, spiritual growth, personal spiritual growth, is the absolute most important thing in sobriety. You need to keep progressing. Procrastination is going to lead to regression. Because if you're not moving ahead, you're going to start moving backwards. And I never want to regress because I never want to live like I used to live. Yeah. I never want to feel that way. Yeah. And even times now when I feel like I'm losing my grip with God, I just had a talk with him on the way home this morning about that. I yeah. says, I'm, I'm losing that feeling again. I said, where are you? What's going on? Um, you need to keep moving ahead. Uh, and the way you do that, and, and to go along with why I didn't think about drinking, 
I have certain things that I have re-educated my mind, and I got that from one of the gentlemen in the program in the book. Um, I've re-educated my mind, and there are certain things that I read, um, certain chapters, how it works, chapter 5, um, into action. Um, those are two chapters. And then I have certain books in the Bible that I read. Uh, Romans and Mark um, are two favorites because I relate to those things. I relate to uh, um, the disciples that were had hair triggers yeah. and were quick to react. Yep. Uh, like cutting ears off and stuff. I <laughs> yeah. understand yeah. it. Yeah. I understand yep. that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was reading about all that this morning, so it just kind of gave me cold chills because I'm like, <laughs> these guys aren't, I'm not so far removed right. from where they are. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about uh, one thing that I have, and this has come in, in with my counseling experience and working with, with folks, uh, the the sense of how, uh, how, what a family, what an immediate family functions like when they've got an alcoholic person in their family and how they, how they're formed as a family or how they adjust or because there's just all kinds of systems that come into play. Um, what do you, what was the experience like for your, for your, for your family? Cause you, I mean, you, you were raising kids, you had kids in the house and you're navigating that in the midst of, cause I gotta be honest with you. Like I can have a hair trigger now as I am with the children, you know, right. cause kids are ki- kids are kids and they do all the kids stuff and, and then they do more kids stuff and eventually you're like, I'm tired of the kids stuff. Uh, and that's me. And that's me as a sober person. So I just wonder, I, I just wonder what that scene was like. What, what had to be, how did people function around you? How did they, how did they make life happen? I was always protecting my badass image. Yeah. Um, which was really a falsehood. Um, eggshells, they were walking on eggshells mm-hmm. and it made it rough. Um, and, and, and the thing you have to, families, if you're living with an alcoholic, whether it be a mom or a dad, it affects the whole family. Sure. It affects everyone in that family. And, and uh, just because you get sober doesn't mean that things are going to get better. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I've found often is, is people that end up getting divorced anyway. Yeah. Um, by the grace of God, we didn't. Yeah. Uh, we got, it took a lot of time to get faith again uh, for her to trust me because um, I, I was such a lion sack. That yeah. I lot, couldn't like, believe nothing. A lot of, de- so a lot of deception there as, as Constant. well. Mm-hmm. So what, what kind of thing, like in general, you can tell me as much as you want to tell me, but what kind of, like, what kind of things are you, are you being deceptive about? Every aspect of my life. I'd be out in the garage drinking scotch. I'd walk in the house. Have you been drinking? No. Where have you been? I was down with the guys or I was over at somebody's house. I wasn't. Mm, yeah. Um, you lie about everything and you deceive about everything. Yeah. Um, and once you've broken that trust, it takes a long time mm-hmm. to trust again. And you know, another thing that's disturbing is trying to keep track of your lives oh yeah okay uh as at work at home you try to keep track of your lives and you get caught and you're just like then you make up another lie to to, it's it is a vicious cycle an absolutely vicious cycle and i don't have to do that no more right you know but it didn't happen overnight you know right yeah i found myself lying and i didn't need to Mm -hmm. there was no reason to and I'm sitting there lying about something. And I'm sitting here going, what are you doing, you dummy? Yeah, yeah. Sam Hill's wrong with you. Well, I'm alcoholic. I'm sick. Yep. You know? Yep. Mm-hmm. Self-inflicted sick, but... Right. And, and it's important for people to understand, right, that, yeah, even though sober, all the behavior patterns that were attached to insobriety still follow you, and the consequences of those behavior patterns still follow you along the way. 
and did it did it feel when sobriety finally came when when you're like it's like okay there's there's a an emerging pattern of you being you being sober for a an extended period of time i'm just wondering if there's then this sort of experience of like now looking at looking at all the looking at all the the stuff mm-hmm. and having to take a really square look at that and say okay though i'm not drinking right now still all of these things exist in life what do you what do you do like when you have to look squarely at that cuz cuz i would be like okay if i can just stop drinking boom fixed you know fixed done great problem solved move moving on but but there but there's so much more right yeah stop drinking when you stop drinking that's just the tip of the iceberg um and I came into the program thinking that's what I was going to do and everything's going to get okay. Boy, was I. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got a rude awakening. That's why you get sponsors. And that's why we uh, we definitely advocate sponsors. And uh, you find that one individual, you work with that one individual, you work on the 12 steps. My first sponsor taught me how to pray. Um, he started... Uh, re-educating and reminding me what I learned as a child about our Heavenly Father, about Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit. Um, And today the the Holy Trinity is now at the head of my program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And then my family. Yeah. And of course, I hold my sponsors. Um, I have my second sponsor now. I hold them very dear to the heart. I love those men. Um, what they've done for me and what they've helped me cope with. Um, even the trivial things, you know. I and mean, when I get, uh, you know, sometimes we revert and uh, we act like children, our behavior. And we, we just kind of get on something and whine. And uh, my sponsor today... Uh, and my first sponsor would just say, you know what, uh, y- you really need to just stop. You're <laughs> acting like a child. You need to grow up, man up, yeah, mm-hmm. and start reading and start praying. And that's something that I learned at church here was about praying, too, was the two-chair concept. Mm. And so I always try to sit in front of an empty chair and I do, I come in early, so I do this sometimes at work. I'll yeah. sit before an empty chair and I pray. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure some guys have walked in already and go, <laughs> <laughs> he's What's talking that? to no one. He's talking to someone who's not there. Yeah, that's right. This boy, you're doing that. Dude's <laughs> flipped out again. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'll just leave him alone till he settles down. <laughs> um, but it, it works. It definitely works. Yeah. Um, I've learned a lot both from the other fellowship and from church. And church has become part of my pro, my twelve step program. Yeah, um, and the men here have become part of it too. I have certain individuals that are, you know, extremely instrumental in my life that I can talk to. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is building a positive support group and belonging to a twelve step group. Um, church is great. Um, I'm glad we have church. I'm glad we have pastors yeah, and uh, men and, and women that can uh, interpret the Bible for me when I don't quite understand it, and then I can go read it for myself sure. and interpret for myself. Yep. But without both places, I'm not sure that my life would be, be starting to become more well-rounded mm-hmm. and Two things is like when I came back and started getting sober, I was hopeless. I had no hope. I, I can honestly sit here and say, for me, life was over. Yeah. I, I it was a total sham. Mm-hmm. Today I have hope. Yeah. But truth and honesty above all things, rigorous honesty is the absolute foundation. You have got to be honest with yourself. Even if you can't be honest with other people, you have to be honest with yourself and you have to be honest with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And if you can't be, you're in a world of hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So I know a lot of times, sometimes it can be hard to be honest for one with yourself, um, but also with those around you that are trying to hold you accountable. Sometimes it's easier to say, I don't need your help. So what, what's some things that you do to help yourself to remember, I need to be honest and, and keep that honesty open with the people who are trying to help you out. I call my sponsor and tell him what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then he provides me with information like, you know, you need to remove your head from a certain part of your <laughs> body. Yeah. And, and um, he's frank with me and he's straight with me. And everything that he tells me is the truth. Yeah. A and from my standpoint, um, I need someone like that in my life. Uh, Pastor Sebastiano talked about this morning. We need those people in our lives. You know, and and by the grace of God, I have them. I have more than one. By the grace of God, I'm very grateful for that. It's good. Yeah, I, I, I think Andy and I, previous guests, we we had a we had a time we were talking about. And again, we love that we love the church. We love we love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and we care deeply about them. They're an instrumental part of our life. At the same time, they're this, that's can be the same group that just drives me most up the wall. Like for, and as a, as a pastor, I'm just I, listeners. I'm just being real. I love all of you. I'm just being real, but let's just be honest. You've met a Christian that you were surprised they were a Christian when you found out they were a Christian. Like, I know this has happened. This has happened to you uh, because we get, we get, we get mixed up about what Jesus following looks like and where we need to be putting our, our, our attentions and our efforts. And, um, and, I just want to, I just want to, I just wonder, uh, because like, I I want to hang, I want as, as a follower of Jesus, I want to hang out in the places, I want to be in the places where, you know, he did not come for the righteous, but for the sick, right? And I mean, Cliff, from your perspective, like, if for, regardless of my job as a pastor, but just me as a follower of Jesus, period, where should I be spending more time? Do you, do you know what I'm saying? I understand, do. understand. Where, where should, because I can be in the church office, I can be in the whatever, and I'll get lots of pats on the back, like, oh, you're doing your, you're doing your job as a professional Christian, great job. But like, if I want to be a Jesus follower, and Jesus went to the places where there were not the righteous, but there were the, there were the sick, and I want to be like that. From your experience, because I, I think this is your heart too. I think this is how you how you operate, and that's what I appreciate about you. Um, what like what do we need to be thinking about as followers of Jesus, where we where we're we're putting ourselves in the right places to have the right conversations? I got that answer today on the way home. Work with other alcoholics. Mm -hmm. Whenever that I feel weak. I start working with other alcoholics. I work with other alcoholics all the time anyway. Yeah. But I need to dig in and I need to get real and I need to get on it. Yeah. I need to go where I came from mm. and help those that cannot help themselves so that they, in turn, can pass along what was given to me freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that man was there for me. It happened to be two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They were there for me. They weren't afraid to approach me. They weren't afraid to face consequences if I got physical, because I was really mm -hmm. ignorant back then. Um, they forged ahead. Yeah. And I agree wholeheartedly, because I read all this this morning. I read them more. Yeah. yeah. I read it. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up, because we spend too much time not helping those that need help. Um, Sylvan. They go into a town, they witness on the streets. Mm -hmm. Martin Thomas does it. Yep. Um, I, I think that the guy sitting here needs to do that mm -hmm. more than I'm speaking of myself. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I'm not mm -hmm. yeah. pointing fingers yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to do more of that. Yeah. I, I also suppose, too, that the more that you're with people who are alcoholics and trying to help them out it's easier than i would I probably i would assume it'd be a little bit easier for you to go i'm not going back there because you're you're involved in that you're seeing what's happening you're reminded daily of what your life used to look like so it'd be easier to say i'm not doing that again but it's real easy to set back and get comfortable mm -hmm. like we do at church sure, sure. and just wait for them to come to the meetings yeah mm -hmm. wrong yeah you go and you speak 
you 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 go and speak at CPR, mm -hmm. which is part of the legal system, mm -hmm. and you speak publicly at meetings with an um, anonymity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Boy, I got to choose my words carefully. It's really messing me <laughs> up, sure. guys. Sure. But um, you, ha I I will always preach this. Uh, anybody that I work with, I will talk to them. I talk to them about three things, three books we use are the Holy Bible, the 12 and 12 in the big book. And the Holy Bible, the one that I like the best is the one my sponsor gave me, and that's the Life Recovery Bible. Mm. And that's because it has the 12 steps in it. You can look in the back and it relates it to nice. Scripture. So the Scripture and the Savior and my program right. yeah. are all, all tied there. in that's all with the big book included in the 12 steps. Mm, yeah. And so for me, the in-depth, the deeper that I get into this, the longer that I go, the more I learn. But I'm also finding out the more I learn, the less I know. Okay. That sounds like humility. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's the absolute truth because yeah. I've got, we got new people come in making statements and I'm going, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You've been sober 30 days, and you just said that? Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Yep. It's just astounding sometimes. Yep. So you can't get puffed up. You can't take credit for things. I give God credit for everything that happens. Mm -hmm. Anybody that I help, um, I don't care what it is, God gets the credit. Yeah. I deserve no credit because I am not worthy. Mm -hmm. Um. He saved my life. Yeah. He just, I don't know how else to put it. He saved my life. Yeah. I owe everything to God. Yeah. And, and, you know, we can, we can debate up and down the merits of, uh, of, of faith and of, of this God of which, uh, Cliff speaks, but uh, the proof is in the pudding as they, as they say, I mean, the, the, the uh, I, I I just am always amazed when people say, "Yep, when it when I was I finally turned over my life," and when I really recognized that I and of myself was unable to overcome mm -hmm. the thing that I was the thing that I was facing, um, and because that, that's like repentance language is what that is. That's a that's a turning over of oneself to uh, to God. Um, you know, that's when I saw, that's when I saw change. That's when things started to, to turn around for me. And until I was able to get to that point, I was just fighting my own battles and doing it on my own. And, uh, and what, a, what an incredibly, I, we don't, we don't think about people that are struggling with addiction as being, as being alone or lonely people. Cause oftentimes they they can be, you know, they can be out quote unquote socializing or, mm -hmm. or they've got their, their crew, but really they're alone. They're alone. Yeah. And, I was alone. Yeah. And that's, uh, I still feel that way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, guys, we need community. We, we, we've said it. We've said it. We'll keep on we'll saying continue it. saying that. Keep on yeah. saying that. Uh, there is nothing like community, of, of, uh, especially Jesus following community of people that are, that are coming around us and supporting us. And so, uh, Cliff, uh, as I said, our time will go quick, and it sure, and it sure has. I am grateful uh, just for your transparency, what you shared. We, we, hope yeah, we that appreciate it, that. We hope that it just encourages somebody to get real and to get help and to reach out. Um, and, uh, and as always, you know, you can contact, here's, here's what we'll do with, with Cliff. You can contact us here at the show. We will con cause Cliff is here to help. Mm -hmm. My number is five, seven, four, here we go. <laughs> five, three, six, four, seven, five, zero. Yep. And you can call me day or night. My phone's on. I will answer my phone. There we go. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're struggling, if you're struggling, there's people that are out here to help, and, and Cliff is one of them, and we're we're incredibly grateful for him. But obviously, before we let Cliff go, oh, we wait. Need, we need to tell you, too, the we, show. We is, do. This episode specifically is brought to you by my good friend, our good friend, the Concrete Barber. He is an amazing barber. Keeps you looking get yourself clean. a real get yourself a real haircut, gentlemen. Looking awesome, straight razor. I do the beard trim over there, and I'm t I'm telling you, it keeps you looking fresh. It Joel. keeps me looking fresh, and not like I just rolled it, out of bed. You know, you know what the concrete barber has. Like, if you're like unsure of what you actually want to look like, yes. he has some great social media. Stuff. He does the I Instagram. Lo I love seeing like the time lapse of him cutting hair. It's great. It's so. great. It's like my own personal haircut uh, <laughs> entertainment. So yes. check out concretebarber.com to schedule your appointment or. 
to get some of his awesome hair products. Fantastic hair products. You can head over there at ConcreteBarber.com. All right. It's that time. Uh, it's Oh, wait. Yes. One thing. Yes. Anytime you want to know what I was like and how I've changed, talk to my wife. She'll tell you. Yeah. Because she lived mm. the first 21 years of our marriage with me in full-blown mm -hmm. alcoholism. Yeah. And trust me, guys, it ain't pretty. Yeah. And why that lovely lady stuck with me, I know why, because God put her there. Yeah. 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 God's yeah. grace, but... That's we're we're and that's in and kudos to you for mentioning that very, very specific woman, because, uh, well, yeah, we all of us sitting here, good wives, good yep. wives behind us. I'm grateful for them. All right. So here we go, Andy. Now it's time for the dudes and dads pop quiz. <laughs> all right. So if you've never joined us, the pop quiz is basically sometimes that we get to just just ask, grill, just grill. Ask some random questions that we literally pull out of a deck, uh, thanks to pod decks. But uh, so here, I'll go ahead and ask the first one. What is your most treasured possession? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> uh, possession. So that would not be my wife. <laughs> Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, yes. well, we're looking I'm, for like a thing. I'm yeah. trying to be safe. You're talking about yeah. material. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have to say either my my truck or my 480 Red Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, good answer. All right. Um, okay, if you could answer one, if you could ask one person one question and they had to answer truthfully, who and what would you ask? I have no idea, gentlemen. <laughs> that's a doozy. Right. Yeah, that's that's a big question. It's, um, I think I think it would be my son Andrew, and what I I would like to ask him what I could have done different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andy, what are you most excited about right now? Honestly, every day is is my wife. Mm -hmm. um, she just she saw me through everything. Yeah. Um, I was presented with an angel, and I live with her. <laughs> yeah. Amen and amen. The fact. Let's just be clear. Cliff just said, "What is he most excited about?" He's most excited about his wife. Somebody's doing something right out. Right. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and again, we've we've talked about we've talked about you've got a you got a long history behind you. So we'll say we'll say this is referring to you right now right now here now what characteristic are you most known for uh probably my nickname the dog the dog sounds like there's a story behind it that was, one. Well, <laughs> boy oh boy i have a habit of barking <laughs> at people i mean literally like a dog like a real yeah like a real that's dog. great all right so mine is going to be a lighthearted one here too if there was a sandwich named after you what would be on it yes um I would say that it would have to be hamburgers, cheese, eggs, jalapenos, french fries, hot dogs. Yes. Uh, I love loving this sandwich. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. it's probably going to kill you, but it's, you're going to go out with a bag. Well, I had one of these up in uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Oh, oh man. Yeah. It, this, this oh, is. that's scary. It's a mile high. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. That okay. Would, all, the, all, the, all the things, all in one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's see. If you could instantly become one, what would you want to be an expert in? Interpreting the word. Yes. You and me both. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Because I feel very, very lacking in that respect. Yeah. Well, and oh, it's one of these, it's one of those books that keeps us humble because every time we approach, it's like a, the, the ancient rabbi said, that the word of God was like a multi-angled prism that as you turned it, the light was reflected in a different way at every, at every turn. And, and I have found that to be true. So yes, I, I say whatever his answer, same for same for me as well. It's wherever you're at in life. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. That's exactly it. So, uh, we Cliff, really appreciate you. We being appreciate on the show. you. And you've, you've survived our, our pop quiz. You have been uh, just incredibly uh, helpful and available guys. If, if any of you, 
if any of you are listening right here and you're like, hey, I just I need to talk to somebody that I think gets where I am at right now. This guy across the table from us, uh, he is open and available. And we'll make sure we uh, we we are make it able. If you just want to contact us as well, we can put you in touch with Cliff. Or uh, if nothing else, there's a there's a local group around you that uh, that wants to provide help for you. So we would just encourage you to reach out. Guys, thanks so much. Yes. Uh, if you have any feedback about this or any of our other episodes, dudesanddadspodcast.com is a great place to get us. Uh, you can call our voicemail number, 574-213-8702. Or, or, or just the a, email. Just send us an email to feedback at dudesanddadspodcast.com. Uh, include, you can take out your phone and like record a memo and send it a to us. A voice memo. A we voice love that. Memo. We Perfect. Love that. Yeah. All the things, guys. We are incredibly grateful that you're listening in. Thanks so much. Continue to remember to like us, to share us, do all the things. Let us know how we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, it's been real, Andy. It's good. All right. It's next time, great. we'll see you later. Yeah, Grace and peace. And peace. Okay. <laughs>